Welcome to episode 58 of the Hunt Back Country podcast, presented to you by Exo Mountain Gear. First things first, I want to give a shout out to Andrew F. for leaving us a review on iTunes. Andrew also mentioned in his review that some of the information shared in this podcast helped him harvest his first elk this year. Super cool story. Congrats, Andrew. Send us your shipping info. We want to send you some Exo Mountain Gear swag for leaving us that review. Listeners, if you could leave us a review on iTunes, if you're enjoying the show, we would really appreciate it. If you do that, or you email us with your questions, comments, or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com, you will be entered to um, be drawn for these Exo Mountain Gear giveaways as well. So thank you so much for doing that. On this episode, we're speaking with Brad Brooks. It's just kind of a fun all-around campfire hunters hanging out conversation. We talk about Brad's season, some late season mule deer tactics, which Brad was right in the middle of hunting. We also dive into some awesome information on do-it-yourself meals. So if you're tired of mountain house and want to explore other options for your backcountry pursuits, we bring you some great alternatives in this discussion tonight. We also dive into some conservation topics, which Brad has a bunch of expertise in and a very helpful perspective on. So hope you enjoy this one. As always, thank you so much for listening. Here's this episode with Brad Brooks. Brad, thanks for joining us. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Awesome. We are just, uh, what, a couple days before Thanksgiving here, so I'm sure we're all getting ready to hopefully uh, take some time off and enjoy some uh, good food and family time and all that fun stuff. You got big plans? Um, not really. I'm actually hoping to stay close to home so I can get out and hunt a few more days here with that late season archery hunt. And, yeah. uh, luckily my wife has agreed to that. Uh, we had to negotiate the plan, but she's agreed to the negotiation. <laughs> so I spend a certain amount of time with family and then I get a certain amount of time to go in the hills. Yeah. That sounds so. pretty familiar. I don't, <laughs> Steve, you were, you were saying with the baby, like if things were going smooth, you're going to get out for the late season a bit. Is that on the cards or is that not going to happen at all? Uh, yeah, not happening. Um, <laughs> not happening. I actually, that I was thinking about doing it, but I had a Brad, I think I told you I crashed pretty bad on my mountain bike, um, about a month ago and I went to, I've been doing physical therapy on my shoulder and I tried to draw a bow on Saturday and felt like I pulled my whole sh- shoulder off my Whoa. body. So yeah, that's uh drawing a bow is not in the cards at the moment. Oh, oh man, that's- that's too bad. I was thinking of you, Steve, because I I know where there are um, some elk for your late season cow hunt, and I was going to oh. talk to you about that uh, after this. Dang call, it! Of course, yeah. <laughs> you have some yeah. listeners who are probably fine with you just sharing the information now, Brad. Yeah. You want me to just give you the GPS coordinates for the <laughs> yeah. show notes? Or? Yeah, and your email address and phone number as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah. So you just, you just got in like today. You've been out chasing them for the last few days, right, Brad? Yeah, I was. Uh, I think chasing is the right word too. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I, I love hunting, running mule deer. It's like it's a blast, but it's also like sometimes it's like the most nerve. Ra- it's like the most frustrating hunting because there's like there's just no predictability sometimes yeah. in their behavior. Uh-huh. It's like they'll be in one spot for like sometimes hours and sometimes minutes. Like I watched a buck bed down that I went to go stock and I thought, oh, he'll be there for at least all I need is 20 minutes. That's how close he was. And like he lasted 10. <laughs> and then other times, you know, they, they'll bed down forever. Um, mm. And I guess the, the it was super fun. I saw one, I was, just, um, you know, telling you guys, I saw one buck that was, it, for me, it was one of the bigger bucks I've ever seen um, you know, on the hoof. And I, I got within 30 yards of him. And the the problem was there were like three other bucks with him and a handful of does. And, um, like it always happens, the does busted me at 30 yards, right at like, right at dark. But, um, yeah, I'll be dreaming about him for a long time. So anyways, yeah, it was fun. Um, and I got a, I got a couple more opportunities to go look for him again. So see if we can make it happen. What have you, uh, I mean, I, we've been, I've been on that hunt a million times and, it's like you said, the most frustrating thing in the world. What's kind of your main tactic for, for getting after him? Just spot and stalk and hope you get lucky, or you try it, sitting, or 
yeah, I would put it under like the kamikaze category. Um, <laughs> no, I, I actually, I, I do a mix of everything. So, um, this, this trip, I really tried to, you know, they're <clears throat> this one area I'm hunting, they're kind of migrating through it right now. And so I really pay attention to if I see deer walking in the same direction to the same spot, like where those spots are. And this trip, I actually found a fairly well used trail, like migratory route that they were using day and night. And I was able to get in a spot the last night I was there and I sat and watched this trail, not knowing if anything would come because I really, I couldn't see a lot other than this one little, little window. And I'm, I mean, I was there all of an hour and I saw what four does came through on that trail and then three smaller bucks and a doe. Um, and then I, I since I saw that one big buck, I kept like, <laughs> I was holding <laughs> out, but, um, but yeah, so that's one tactic. And then, you know, I will try a spot and stock if the situation is right. Um, mm-hmm. but I won't waste my time spot and stock on mule deer if they're, if there's does all around them. You know, and I don't think I can actually make a stock. I'll wait. I'll just wait that buck out if I see a buck I like until he gets in a position that I think is stockable. I'm, I'm certainly not going to rush down in there um, and try and force something where it's just unrealistic to make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I do. Anyways, I just do a mix um, because sometimes those bucks will bed down for a while, just like, you know, when you're hunting early season and sometimes they don't. And, um, seems like I end up taking my shoes, my boots on, on and off a lot and putting my stock and socks on, <laughs> but, uh, a lot of failed attempts, but, um, I would also rather, I mean, the last thing I'll say on that is I will, I will hunt even if I, even if I can't see as much, I think, I think a lot of people get sucked into looking at big open country where they can just see a lot and there's maybe not a lot of cover. Mm-hmm. I'll prefer, I'll ignore a lot of that country, um, and I will prefer to hunt like somewhere where I, I can't, maybe I can't see as much, but I know if I do see something, I'm going to have a good shot at stocking it. Hmm. So I kind of limit myself to, and it's really hard to do too. Cause I love just like getting out in the open and seeing big country and like, you know, the glass up, you know, 20, 30 deer. Um, but if I can't get on them, it's like, what's the point, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a, such a tough hunt. It's just the amount of eyes and other hunters, and man, it's yeah, it's, it's a crapshoot. It is, yeah. Is there any uh, any predictability to timing, like buck behavior and bedding, and because I mean, you totally are losing the typical early season, like you know, feed, bed, move, yeah. you know, that whole sort of schedule, if you will. It just seems like it could be chaos. So, like, how do you? You know, are you making any sort of strategic play of like, all right, here's what I'm going to do in the morning versus midday versus, you know, whatever, or it's just a matter of getting out there and, and seeing what you turn up? Well, this last trip, um, after I kind of figured out a pattern, I was sitting evening, I mean, it was fairly standard, right? It was like, I actually wish I knew a little bit more about like tree stand hunting. It's where I, I want to call up some of my friends in the Midwest. Um, I was sitting e- early and late watching this one trail and this one window and it was super productive um and then during the day i mean it it varies you know sometimes during the rut they're up all day chasing does Mm -hmm. um and you know some bucks are you know if they'll they'll wander around until they find a doe and then they find a hot doe you know it's like it can be total chaos and 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 there's no predictability so i tend to like be still um and find a place where I can theoretically try and shoot a deer, you know, passing by is my strategy. Like and, ambush uh, style. Yeah, more a little more ambush style because, I mean, the that big buck I saw, like, I had to try and spot and stalk him at dark. And, you know, I don't know about you guys, but, like, trying to rush a uh, spot and stalk is with that many eyes on you is – and there was no wind and so there was no nothing to cover my noise. It's just really hard to execute that um, when you're, t- you're crunched for time. So, you know, my, at least my, my operating theory is that, it, you know, even if I'm not going to see as many deer, um, if I do see one, if I'm waiting in the right spot and you can pattern them, then at least I'm going to have an opportunity to just shoot that deer instead of seeing one right at dark, you know, on the other side of a canyon and being like, oh, that was really cool to see that deer, but I'm never going to get on him. Mm-hmm. Um, and during the rut, you know, you're not, uh, at least in my experience, like, 
just because a deer is there is one day, like he could be, you know, miles away the next day. They can move at night, you know, especially if they're migrating mm -hmm. through, which is what they're doing in that country I hunt. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that's always my frustration with that hunt too. Is just like, you feel like if you see a deer, you gotta go kill it now, you know, cause you don't mm -hmm. have that. Oh, I'm going to wait for, you know, even if you feel like you wait for four hours, some other hunter is going to come by and bump them or yeah, it's freaking tough. Yeah. I mean the high, it makes running, hunting, hunting, uh, running mule deer bucks makes like early season high country mule deer, uh, hunting, you know, seems so easy, frankly, yeah. Oh, yeah. just so much more predictable. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Are you, are you noticing patterns, Brad, on like certain, uh, you know, terrain features and things like that where they're using these migratory routes and you're seeing the most trail activity? Yeah, they don't. Um, I mean, I mean, it's not, this is like going to be a big surprise, but it's, you know, I think deer, just like any, any, well, not like any species. Um, and I'll just speak to like, this is one, this, this particular type of mule deer hunting. Cause I, I, I haven't hunted late season in a bunch of different places. So I don't know what it's like there, but, um, I've noticed, you know, they tend to hang where there's cover when they're, you know, they know they're going to be covering distances. So they're not totally exposed. So they might pop in and out of the trees. It might be fairly open, but there's, there's cover close by. Um, and they're, they're not on top of the ridge. They're just off the ridge. So they're not walking, you know, the top ridge trail, um, just cruising down that. They're like, you know, 30 to, you know, a hundred yards off the top, uh, maybe a little more even sometimes kind of cruise side hilling along, following the topographic features. Yeah. <clears throat> Good stuff. So we, that's, that's, that's what I've noticed anyway. So yeah, I mean, it makes sense yeah, that they want to move yeah. with cover for sure. Yeah. So skipping, uh, skipping, I guess hit and reverse a little bit just to introduce yourself a little bit more for the listeners, Brad, we kind of got distracted to talk about hunting, which is a good thing, but can you give us some context on, uh, your history, kind of what you're up to, uh, professionally as well as your hunting experience and things like that? Uh, yeah, I'll try and that's a, there's a bunch to cover there, but I'll try and <laughs> Go um, for it. cover some of that. I'll start. So, um, yeah, I, uh, my name is Brad Brooks. I have, uh, I, I'm a, I do conservation work, uh, for a living and, uh, also have a company called Argali and Argali is a company that, um, our, our mission is to protect the wild hunting experience. And we kind of, I kind of couch ourselves as sort of a one-stop shop for backcountry hunting. Um, we do some filming. Um, I have a film called Chasing Ridgelines in the hunting film tour this year. Um, we have some featured content on our site sort of geared towards like do it yourself, backcountry hunting, um, tips and tactics. Um, and then we have some other stuff coming with the, with the website here. Um, soon, um, we're actually going to be, um, the website will have a store function. So we'll be selling backcountry hunting, sort of lightweight backcountry hunting gear here, um, by March of next year. And, uh, I can't remember what else you got. Oh, you asked about my, my hunting background, Mark. Yeah. Just anything you, you okay. want to share for context. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, uh, let's see. I, you know, just like a lot of folks have been on your show, hunted all my life. Um, I probably didn't really, I feel like, so I played uh, college soccer and I don't feel like I really got serious about becoming what I would call, you know, more of a, a back country hunter until right till after college. Um, cause I didn't really grow up. I didn't have anybody like taking me out and putting a backpack on me and telling me like, this is how you get it, you know, away from other hunters and really get into animals. Um, it was sort of just a process of a uh, function of me really not wanting to see anybody else ever when I'm out hunting. <laughs> and I realized that, that the only way to do that was to, to be, I don't know, um, just to be a little bit dumber than everybody else and being willing to walk further and kill something further away from um, anywhere that anybody else wanted to go. Um, so that, that, that was kind of my, my foray into um, backcountry hunting and um, yeah kind of describe myself as somebody who uses all weapons. Although this was actually the first year I, I hunted with a bow, um, as, as Steve knows. And I mostly did it just because I have like, you know, a bunch of friends who are, who are very, uh, hardcore about archery hunting and that's all they use. And, and I'm sort of a, like, I'll use whatever weapon is in season type hunter, but 
I had like just <laughs> I had I had a couple of friends who you know they'd seen some of the animals I shot and they're like yeah those are nice but like you know anybody can kill those with a muzzle loader or a rifle and you really <laughs> haven't killed anything till you kill the bow so I was like I had a little bit of a chip <laughs> on my shoulder I'm like all right uh, all right I'll up the ante you want me to kill something with a bow I'll do that yeah <laughs> show you what's up so, so did you yeah. just start shooting as well then like to prepare for this year I I I uh. I bought uh, Ben Gatormson's uh, old bow in oh, you're December. Just, you're just hoping that Ben's like magic juju juice, what, you know, just came with the That's, bow, right? All of his luck. Yeah, if you can't, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> That's that a was, good strategy. Was, I like it. I'm like Ben knows how to shoot. Yeah, uh, uh, he knows how to kill animals. Let me just like borrow that. Yeah. Um, I like I literally started shooting a bow in December of last year. Um, and, but the thing about me, Mark though, is like, I don't like, I don't do something like casually. So right, you're just all in. when I say I started, yeah. So when I say I started shooting it last year, it was like, you know, it was like five to seven days a week for a while. Yeah. Um, just trying to get, not, not that I'm like incredible at it, but, um, I, I definitely, yeah, it wasn't was just like super time. casual. Yeah. No. So what, what surprised you about that process? Just getting into archery and, that. um, Let's see. Oh, the first thing was how insanely expensive it is. Um, cause I thought, <laughs> like, I, like, it just like every little thing, like, yeah, it's how, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, you need to buy more because I was like trying to shoot at distance. So I was like breaking arrows and, and, uh, you know, if I had like a bad day, it's like, oh man, I need to buy some more arrows, like more broadheads. Um, so beside, beyond the cost, I'll just say about the process. Um, I, I don't, I think, I feel like, you know, archery is really, it wasn't that hard, especially the compound to get good at it, but it was hard to master. It mm -hmm. is hard to master. So like you can, I didn't feel like it took me very long to where I could shoot out to like 60 yards and pretty comfortably hit like a decent, decent group. But it was like, it was sort of erratic. Like I wasn't consistent enough to where I was like, oh yeah, I would shoot at an animal in windy conditions under pressure at that distance that took a little bit more, uh, more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That makes a ton of sense. I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for like going out to the range and, you know, non hunting conditions and, you know, throwing some arrows down range at a pretty good, uh, and a pretty good group and things like that versus like shooting really well in those high pressure situations when you're, you know, you're dealing with the things you mentioned like wind and angles and funny positions and non-perfect stances and, you know, like yeah. things can go downhill fast for sure. Yeah. And you know, <laughs> it's funny. So, or at least I'm laughing about it now. The one, one thing I would do to like, um, sort of replicate a hunting scenario where you, maybe you've got your heart rates increased a little bit is I would drink uh, a bunch of coffee <laughs> and get that caffeine buzz going and then i would go try and shoot my bow and i don't know if you guys have done that or not but like that is a that's a great i, th I thought it was a great way to sort of simulate the um sort of the heart palpitations you can get from uh you know when you're in the in the moment trying to shoot an animal yeah <laughs> Steve I drink way too much coffee, though. <laughs> I was going to say, Steve used to do that, but he drinks so much coffee now that it just doesn't. Like, he's got ice in the veins. I'm a new... <laughs> you haven't drinking my coffee yet, man. I'll make you my French press pot, and if you're not, right. if you're not shaking a little bit, then I'll, I'll be shocked. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> cool. So let's back up and talk a little bit more about our galley. Something you mentioned is kind of a different about, you know, the mission that you guys have with uh, starting the site and things like that. There's... There's plenty of guys out there who are, you know, have websites and are doing films and, you know, even stores and gear and all that. But, you know, you mentioned something that there's a little bit different angle of why you're putting all this together through our galley. Kind of expand on that a little bit because this is just kind of something that was glossed over, but I think important to talk about. Yeah. So the re the reason. So we started out making, wanting to make a film, and, but but my, um, I guess my motivation for wanting to do it maybe was different than than some other folks. Um, again, I, I really, I'm a, I am a conservationist at heart. I believe in the value of conservation, not only of, of public lands but also for wildlife. And I wanted to really, I wanted to tell a story that was about the importance of of place and wild places when it comes to hunting. Um, and my 
my business partner, Jason, and I sort of had the same conviction. And so we, we just have this idea in our head that, you know, if we can tell stories that are about wild places and that, you know, can further, you know, help introduce people to the idea of conservation, the importance of wild places in particular, um, for, to the hunting experience, um, then that's something that we, w- we wanted to do. And that was really sort of the, the basis of, of why we founded Argali. So our, and I, I do think that's different than most people, instead of just, you know, heading out with the camera and like saying, we just want to like film some stuff. Um, our, 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 you know, directive right from the beginning was very, very focused and mission driven. And the films, in some ways, were just a, a way to, 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 you know, achieve our broader mission, and it still is. And that's still the same thing with Argali. You know, I, I really, there's a couple, a couple of the reasons we started the site, too. And, and one of them is that, you know, um, I think not everybody feels like backcountry hunting is an approachable way to go hunting, particularly if you're just getting into it. And, and frankly, it's, I think it's intimidating for some people. And I, I think that's too bad because it's all, it, it's really, I don't, I don't think it's that, um, that hard to approach it even as a beginning hunter. Um, I think the barriers to entry are quite low. Um, and if you are out to have, you know, sort of uh, an experience where you're just in a wild place experiencing, you know, animals doing their thing without being, um, you know, not responding to other people necessarily. They're just sort of living their lives and you're just, you're just observing them. Um, as opposed to trying to hunt animals that are responding to other humans, um, you can do that. And I wanted to, we wanted to, you know, find a way to help people have those experiences and try and break down some of those perceived barriers. Cause I think a lot of them are mental, frankly. Um, and the other thing is just, you know, if you don't have somebody helping you to figure out how you can have those experiences, you're never going to have them. Um, and then sort of part and parcel of that is, you know, I think if, if, you know, when I look, um, just on the, from the conservation side of it, you know, the only, I know full well that the only reason in the future we're going to continue to have these, you know, sort of what I would call wild hunting experiences or backcountry hunting experiences is if people, um, there are, there are people that have had those experiences and can speak from, um, uh, speak from experience. I feel like I've used that word a lot in this sense. Um, <laughs> about why about why those are uh you know these places are important to to protect for hunting i mean why it's important to protect hunting um and game animals in particular so if we can help people have those experiences there's a self-fulfilling prophecy about how that will help um propagate uh conservation into the future um and i don't i don't have any like grand you know illusion delusions that we're gonna (laughs) you know like save the world through this our site or anything but you know, if it helps a few people um, get out and and have a great time, then you know that makes me that fulfills me and makes me happy. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It's cool what you said there about you know just us sharing our experiences and how helpful that is for for the future of hunting and of conservation. And you know that's that's true. I think of guys who like have a website and are doing film like you guys are, but I think it's true for all of us. Just telling those stories to you know people that we work with people we run into um you know backcountry hunters and true hunter conservationists need to speak up for you know to show the positive side of hunting so i think it's cool that you guys are doing it through film and through the site but it's an it's uh encouraging to hear that it's something that we can all do even in small ways but it makes a difference yeah that's i mean i don't not not that i get asked a lot this but that's one thing i i do like recommend to folks that anybody now can, you know, you can shoot a film and, and put it out there. And I know a lot of, a lot of folks are doing it and put out some great content, but I always tell people like, you know, before you pick up your camera and go out and try and make a film, if you're just filming for fun, then that's great. But if you want to make a film, like just ask yourself, like just very, very simply, like what is the story you're trying to tell and why are you trying to tell it? And if you can answer those two questions and come up with a, a reason that you think is sufficient, then like, then I think you have the the components of, of a good narrative. And that, that really is what I think makes for good films. The, the, the good, the films that I like, and this is just, maybe this is just my, my take on it, but the films that I like watching in the hunting world are films that are not about like individuals necessarily, but maybe, you know, bring in interesting 
maybe it's about the place. Maybe it's an interesting, you know, just honest narrative about, you know, friends or, you know, whatever it is. But um, it, it's clearly um, there, there seems to be always be a well thought out narrative uh, behind it. Um, mm-hmm. Whether that was intentional or not, I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to, I want to encourage your listeners too, in addition to uh, the films that we've mentioned, which you can kind of find there as well, if you head over to the site, as you kind of mentioned, one of the goals is to uh, sort of lower the barrier of entry or uh, give some guys some good information. So you guys have articles on, um, you know, tips for the aspiring backpack hunter, things like choosing a lightweight tent and scouting tips, things like that. So certainly worth checking out some of the information there as well as the films. Uh one of the articles you have, it kind of piqued my interest, and I'd love to dive into it a bit if we can, Brad, is uh, on making your own backcountry meals. Um, and that's something that <laughs> I've wanted to get beyond, um, you know, being stuck with Mountain House and explore options and, you know, yeah. kind of dehydrating some of my own stuff and recipes. And it looks like you have, uh, you've gone down that road. So if we could just talk about that a bit, it'd be awesome. Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about my my lazy chef approach to backcountry meals. <laughs> Let's hear it, man. Explain what, what's your uh, what's kind of your go to your process and how you put things together. I, I, I my my process is like is simplicity is key. So um, I, I actually started doing this because, as many people I'm sure you can relate to, like I my stomach could not take another mountain house shoved down my mouth. It was like. <laughs> It's like you keep putting this stuff down here and I'm going to, I'm going to spit it out one of these days. So <laughs> I was like, I just couldn't do it anymore. So, um, and mountain house, if you're listening to this, um, I, I don't mean any ill will torture company. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, so that, that's what got me started on it. So then I just started looking at like, okay, what are like the most simple foods that, you know, only require the addition of water. So anything, anything that requires cooking, in the back country is just like it wastes time and it wastes fuel. Um, so, you know, if you have to do more than boil water in my mind, that's just, that's a complete waste of time and, and energy. So on that vein, I literally went to the grocery store and just started looking at things that you could just add water to. Um, uh, there, there was no, it wasn't more, any more scientific than that. And there are a few, you know, base products, um, uh, because I'm a I'm a proud Idahoan, we have uh, there's there's a, a company that makes instant mass, mashed potatoes, and you can find the brand name on our site on our article, and those are super cheap. They're like less than a dollar for a pack, and they're very filling. Like if you can eat more than one pack of those, I'm very I'm impressed. Like they just seem to keep expanding in your stomach. Um, and then uh, couscous is another uh, staple. Um, couscous is, you know, still fairly, relatively, um, cheap, um, and easy to, uh, just add water to. So if you're, if you haven't, what I would say to people is if you're not comfortable, like dehydrating your own food yet, um, but you're cheap, um, like, like I, I am, um, and you just want to have some other options than mountain house, you can, you know, with mashed potatoes and couscous, and then you can mix your proteins. Like you can add, if you're, I can't do it anymore, but I used to do it. I used to just add, get the tuna in a pouch, not a can, but a pouch, and add that in. Um, I can't choke that down anymore because I think I ate too much of it. Um, and then you can also buy, like, salmon in a pouch um, or, you know, whatever protein you want. If you want, like, some tofu or whatever else floats your boat. Um, and then I also try and add in – it's hard to do unless you're dehydrating, dehydrating your own uh, food, but then try and add in a vegetable – Um, so you have a nice mix of like proteins and carbohydrates. Um, so that's, but that's what I would recommend if you just want to like try out a non mountain house meal. Um, that's very simple, pretty cheap. If you are willing to do start dehydrating your own food, which is super easy. And I recommend that everybody buy a small dehydrator. Um, what I like to do is you can, you can dehydrate. and, And I learned this from, there was this uh, old crusty trail worker that I, I did a trail um, trail maintenance uh, trip with a long time ago in the Soy Bitterroot Wilderness, and uh, he he's the one that taught me that you can dehydrate anything you want and then just rehydrate it by adding water out in the field. And he said, all you need to do is just cook you know cook whatever you're gonna you want to eat, cook it first, dehydrate it, 
and then put it in a bag. And then when you get out of the field, just add water and let it sit for, you know, 15 to 20 minutes and you've got your meal. And that sort of blew my mind. I didn't realize it was that simple. So I started playing around with that. And, um, now sort of the, you know, I'll, I'll, you can cook, I know you can cook pretty much anything and I, I do, but some of my favorite meals are like, you know, I'll do like Zatarans, black beans and rice or red beans and rice and cook that. I'll cook them in bulk. So I'll do like three, four, um, uh, packages at a time, dehydrate them. It only takes a few hours. And then I have, and then I'll, I'll take a bunch of ground. I like to use elk or deer burger and <clears throat> I'll cook up, you know, five or six pounds of that dehydrate it and then i'll just you know add you know i add a pretty healthy amount of protein to my meals but you can add as much as you want depending on um, how much you eat um so and then i'll dehydrate i'll just buy like frozen vegetables and i usually just buy like broccoli and corn i never seem to be able to get corn to rehydrate so i don't buy corn but broccoli and carrots tend to be really good options uh, just, you know, cook them really quick, um, in boiling water, throw them in the dehydrator, and then I'll just mix veg- a vegetable, uh, a starch and a protein together, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and you've got, you know, a meal and I tend to do it in, you know, in bulk. So I'll spend like two nights doing it and I'll have enough meals for, you know, the entire season. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. What, the what type of bag are you using to put it in when you rehydrate it or just a Ziploc bag? Yeah, just a Ziploc bag. Yeah, I get like quart, uh, quart or sandwich bags uh, to put mm-hmm. it in. Um, okay. I haven't, you know, I, I am not a dehydrating expert at, by any means. So, um, you know, <clears throat> but one thing I have not been able to master is dehydrating eggs. So if there's anybody out there that knows how to do that, I'd love <laughs> to know your secret. Because <laughs> I've wasted a lot of eggs figure, trying to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny, the, the more I've talked to guys who do this, because it's, it's something that I've been interested in, but like a lot of things, I've, I'm very like detail oriented. So I'm thinking like, all right, well, what's the right like dehydrating time and dehydrating temperature? And when you're rehydrating, like how much water do you need and for how long? And you like getting lost in all these details. But most of the guys that I've talked to now that do this, they're just like, yeah, you just kind of dehydrate it and then add heat and water and you're done. Like, it, you know, it's almost like you kind of can't really mess it up too bad, you know? You got to try really hard, I think, yeah. to mess it up, especially when you're doing, like, burger. Yeah. Um, and I think if you try and – I've had, I haven't had great luck, like, trying to dehydrate, like, chunks of, um, like, steak, what some people might call jerky. Um, and then trying to rehydrate that is a little a little tricky. Um but man, it is hard to screw up. I, I literally like, I can never like, this tells you how organized I am, Mark, but like I go out to dehydrate burger and I'm always like, I had it written down somewhere, like how much time, but I I've lost that sheet of paper now. <laughs> so now I'm like, eh, maybe 10 hours, maybe eight hours, yeah. I, you know, uh, whatever. I'll just do eight and go to bed yeah. and I'll come out in the morning <laughs> Check it. and it, it's just, yeah, it's done. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, that's so, cool. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna start playing this winter and and try and you know, test some recipes and do some rehydrating before I rely on it for the backcountry trips for sure. But I definitely want to start playing with it. And and there's two. So two other notes. Like I get questions about like, well, how much water do you add to rehydrate it? And the my my simple answer for that is like just add a, like add some water and you like if you don't mind your meal being a little soupy. Um, you can just drain it out afterwards, but like just add a little extra. So add, you know, two cups or a cup and a half and, <clears throat> and it's usually more than a cup and a half, but don't worry about it so much. <clears throat> don't worry about measuring it out. Mm-hmm. Um, you, Mark, you'll probably like measure it all out to like the, you know, the, to a T, but I don't worry about it that much. Cause I just, it's just like something I don't really want to have to think about. It's like, eh, about this much cover it in water let it sit and then it's like warm and has the right consistency and that's all that i really care about yeah um and the last thing i was going to say is that this year i found um, which is also on the site dehydrated uh butter from this company in pennsylvania yeah i was just looking Um, at this hoosier hill farm site that you linked to i was gonna ask you about it yeah i received zero royalties from them but i feel like (laughs) i should start asking them for money yeah you need Um, an affiliate program with them they have an affiliate program, but like, I have no desire to get money right, from right. them. I just like want to badger them. 
in the like business that I'm giving them for free. Um, no, they're, uh, yeah, this dehydrated butter. I mean, it's not like your, it doesn't like taste like when you put a cube of butter in your mouth, but it has like butter flavor to it and it adds great calories. So, yeah. um, great product. I recommend it to mm-hmm. any, I know there's a few different brands out there, but that one, I haven't tried all of them, but that one, Hoosier Hill Farms one seems to be pretty good. I'm on their site right now, Brad, and it actually looks like instead of paying you, they just came out with a product they named after you. I'm seeing a uh, dried Big Daddy Mac mix. <laughs> so it's a macaroni oh. and cheese mix. It looks like it's thought, in, in your honor. I, I thought I had, yeah, I thought I had copyrighted that name. The Big Daddy <laughs> Mac, it's right there. I'm going to have to talk to my lawyer tomorrow about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Who's your whole farms? Thank you so much for yeah, the shout out. Shout so out. generous of you. I'm also seeing yeah. powdered eggs, Brad. So maybe there's part of the solution to your dehydrating. I know. <laughs> I know. I could just buy them, but like <laughs> my the stubborn part of me is like yeah. I need to I need to just figure this out on my own. That's great. It looks like they have like powdered and dehydrated everything. Yeah, I, they I'm sure they do. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome, man. That's good. What what else do you do food wise? I mean, I'm assuming you're doing that primarily for you know your main entree, your dinner. You just kind of like a bar and snack guy throughout the day then to fill up calories. Yeah, I, I'm like I eat a lot, so I'm not like my brother is the kind of guy where he like takes like a couple granola bars and like he's good for an entire day, and I'm like starving every couple hours. So I um uh and I can't remember exactly off the top of my head all what I take now, but Typically a couple pro bars. I don't cook during the day because I'm on the go and I don't like to carry, I don't like to go to the trouble of getting my stove out um, unless it's really like cold out and I want to make like a hot drink or something to warm up with. Um, but yeah, bars, uh, almonds, and some dried fruit, um, and then chocolate. So high calorie, um, typically, you know, calorically dense foods. They weigh a little bit more, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's in my experience, like it's totally worth it to take the real foods that have real calories and typically high on fats and high on proteins, not a ton of like just, you know, uh, carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say not any carbohydrates, but I try and get more, you know, more on the fat and protein side. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's, um, I'd love to uh, dive into Beyond Our Golly, some of your professional experience and talk a bit about what you're doing um, and have done uh, on the conservation side of things professionally, if we could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you, I know that you've kind of had uh, a sort of a few different roles in that arena. What are you up to now um, in that realm? So I, I currently, um, I work for the Wilderness Society and I run our, our public lands takeover team. Um, and that's, that's probably a, um, when I say it out loud, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it, <laughs> like a good, like a good team. Um, <laughs> it's the team of folks that are working to keep public lands public, um, across the country. Um, so, you know, we, we have, my company's headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we have sort of offices throughout the West, and we do, we work on a, a variety of different issues. And, uh, um, you know, I've, I've worked on sort of backcountry, what I call backcountry conservation for better part of like 10 years. Um, and yeah, right now we've kind of just hyper focused, uh, most of my time on just trying to, you know, you know, defend the idea of public lands. Um, try and educate folks on what, you know, what public lands are and why they're important. Um, and it, you know, it, it's probably, it often comes as a surprise to people, um, but it's not a surprise to me because I've seen the data. Um, you know, when you look across the country, we do our, you know, polling, public lands in general are just incredibly poorly understood. Um, most people don't, you know, have no idea what public lands are. Um, people have more familiarity with like the Forest Service. Uh, because generally, you know, Americans like trees, but they don't like desert landscapes. So like the agency, the, like the BLM is not, not well known. Um, and if you ever want to see some really interesting polling data, you look at the favorability rating of Forest Service versus the BLM and the poor BLM employees are not well. They don't have a very strong favorability rating. And it has almost nothing to do with the actual employees or the land. It just has to do with Americans' attitude towards trees versus desert landscapes. Um, 
So yeah, so we we focus a lot on uh, right now and just trying to keep uh, public lands public in a in a variety of different ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean that whole issue is something we've talked about a bit um, and seems to be coming up more and more. That you know the at least the rumblings, the talks of uh, uh, public land transfers to states and things like that. I mean it's been you know a discussion point for states like Utah. Did I just see recently? I think there's some sort of headline where there's some sort of, uh, I don't want to say progress on that, but some sort of discussion popping up with Nevada as well recently. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's just like, yeah, it's just kind of everywhere. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I know you guys have talked about it and I, you know, we can approach it different, however you want, Mark. I don't, I don't, we don't need to beat a dead horse necessarily, but I can, I can tell you, you know, whatever, whatever you want to know about what we're doing on it or, or you know, my take on it too. Yeah, no, I mean, I'd love to hear, you know, your perspective as well. I mean, we all have uh, different perspectives and are coming from different places. And just because we've talked about it before doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it again. I mean, we've talked with, you know, the good folks from like the TRCP and BHA, and that's all great. But, you know, it takes, I think, uh, a team of all of us to to continue to keep the issue on the radar and address it and, you know, uh, keep all the listeners informed is you know, just as I am an everyday hunter, it's like, well, what, what does it, you know, what really role can I play and things like that. So it's definitely that discussion to, to keep kicking around mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Well, I, it's, it's really hard for me not to get fired up on this issue just because <laughs> I, I really don't, as someone who, who lives, you know, eats, sleeps and breathes hunting. Um, I just can't fathom a world where I didn't have public lands. I just don't know what my life would be like. So, and I know there are other hunters who, who feel the same way, but, um, if people really, I think understood the threat and what really is at stake, um, and that it's 100% real, um, you know, I, I feel like we might get a few more people, you know, interested in the topic. Um, I mean, the idea that I can't, you know, we're, I am, Steve and I are so spoiled because we can, within minutes, we're in, you know, on public land. Um, and we can hunt within, you know, yeah, not very far from my house. Um, and the idea that that might not be available for my daughter is just mind boggling to me, frankly. Um, the idea that I, you know, I, I won't be able to pass those experiences on to her that she might have to, you know, ask permission. She might have to, you know, you know, pay a fee or, you know, whatever else she might have to do. It's just incredibly frustrating to what I consider to be the the Western way of life, frankly. And this is not just a Western issue. I think it gets relegated to the West, but you know, there's a, there's a lot of public land in the East and and even in the Midwest. And in some ways it's almost, you know, it's a scarce resource. It's almost more important um, to some folks because they don't have as much of it as maybe some of us out West do. Um, So it's, 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 yeah, again, I just like, I think about it and I'm like, what would my life be like if I didn't have public lands? I'm like, well, I don't know if I'd be a hunter, frankly. Like, I don't know what that would be like because the kind of hunting I like to do is I like to get, I just like to get as far away from, you know, everybody else that I can. And, you know, that's the kind of experience I'm looking for. And that's not the same kind of experience everybody's looking for, but whether you hunt on an ATV, a motorcycle, whether you like to hike, doesn't matter. It's like you have free access, 100% free access. And there are people that want to take that away from you. And the, the sort of the irony is, is like they're trying to get people to voluntarily relinquish what they currently own. And some people are buying it. Um, and it's just a classic, you know, poker trick, sleight of hand trick. And, um, I guess my, if there's one mission I have <laughs> I've realized in life, it's like, I'll be damned if it's going to happen on my watch. Like I'm not going to, I will do everything I can in my power to make sure that that, that, uh, public land stay public. You know, I've, I've always just been a really, uh, passionate person when it comes to issues that I care about. And for whatever reason, I, I don't feel like I chose conservation work. I feel like it chose me. You know, I, I was like, I was a computer science major when I first started in college and, and was just really drawn to, uh, conservation because I was just, I cared a lot about it. And, uh, that hasn't, you know, deceased, you know, 
gone away in any way. And, um, you know, whether it's, you know, my personal life, my, my job, day job, or whether through Argali, I mean, I still feel like the, the broader purpose of those is to, to further something that is not really about me. Um, it's about conservation. So I feel like I'm just rambling on here. Mark, but, <laughs> no, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Well, so what's the, the kind of the big issue as a whole, the, 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 the lands federally owned in general or state owned or both or, and then certain people are trying to buy that land for private development. Um, kind of what's the, just the big picture item looking a thousand feet down. Yeah. So public land, Oh, it's owned by the people. So it's not owned by the federal government. That's the, um, uh, although a lot of folks have the misconception. So public land owned by the public managed by the federal agencies, um, the folks that there are folks that want to take it out of public ownership and give it to state government. So state, state, state land is very different than, than at least in the, in all the Western states. I don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert on Midwest or Eastern states, but in the West, state land is not public land. It is what we call endowment lands. They're managed for maximum resource or for revenue uh, generation. Um, and, so in states, unlike public land, state land, um, it's managed, managed under a completely different regime. Um, citizens don't own it. You don't have any say in how it's managed. Uh, public land, you have a say in how it's managed. You may not like it all the time. Everybody kind of, we all have our opinions on how it could be managed better. And there's no doubt that there's room for improvement. But the fact of the matter is we all own public land now. And if it, if it goes to states, States will own it, and Western states also have a very strong track record of selling their lands because their remember their their mandate is not access; it's not providing access for hunters or mountain bikers or any other recreationists. Their mandate is maximum revenue generation. Period. And so, whatever generates the maximum revenue um, is what they're going to do. And collectively, Western states have sold 31 million acres of land. Um, which is roughly equivalent to the size of the state of Louisiana. So this idea that we would give lands to the state and then they wouldn't sell them, um, you know, I'm like over here with my statistics sheet looking at it and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe, maybe not, but they've already sold, you know, this much. Why the hell would we give it to them? And what's the, what's the upside? Um, and as a hunter, I see zero upside and potentially a lot of consequences. Um, the biggest one being lost access, and it's not like it's going to ha- it would happen overnight, but it it would it would ha- most likely happen over a long period of time. Um, mm-hmm. But the f- yeah, so anyway, and the folks that are pushing this campaign are savvy politicians, and they figured out a way to message it. They really tried to make this like a partisan issue that's that's about states' rights versus federal rights. And they're truly really trying to pull the wool over people's eyes on this one. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering what what is the state's argument when they're approaching whoever about we should take over control. So they're just yeah, this, yeah. the states aren't the states are not the states are mostly neutral on this. Most most state governments don't really you know they're not involved in the fight. This is a very limited set of folks with a political agenda who are suggesting that we give it to give it to states. So what's their agenda? Are, like why? Why do these people care? Well, they're a. They're not. I can't imagine they're hunters because I can't imagine anybody who owns on public land could. Right. I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Do this. I think you know these are mostly you know Eastern bureaucrats. Frankly, these are folks that could care less about private lands or access. These are guys who just philosoph. It's a philosophical issue for them. Um, if you read some of the stuff they write, it's like you know. Um, I just read something the other day. It's like I just think. You know, his argument was, I just think people tend to take care of things better when they own them. So let's privatize all public lands. The people that will own them will take care of them. Um, you know, that maybe there's some, I know I'm not saying that there may be some truth there, but their, mm-hmm. their argument is really based on this, this ideology that the public should not own any land. That's it. There's no real logic behind it other than a, there's a philosophical idea. And that's where it comes from. And would this have to go um, to a? I mean, obviously, this would have to go to a vote, and people would have to decide on this. Or is this something that just could get passed through legislature, and nobody would ever know about it? So con- the only 
state legislatures have no authority over fe- over federal um, right. public lands. Only Congress does. Um, Only Congress. Okay. Congress can and has. There are bills in Congress right now. Um, Randy Newberg just did a blog uh, video on this uh, last week. There were two bills that had a hearing last week. Uh, one of them was a bill to give all management decision making authority in Nevada over to the state. So there, are, there are a lot of these bills that were, I mean, they're in Congress right now, that are trying to sort of chip out, chip away at this idea of public lands. And I'm, I'm, I wish I were making this up. Um, I never thought I was going to be in a position of having to defend the idea of public lands as someone who loves to use them. But you know, <laughs> here we are. Um, I. And I, you know, my plea to everybody who listens to this is just like, you know, I know people hate politics. I know it's annoying. I know it's just like, you know, especially after the presidential election, nobody wants to talk about it. And you're sick of all your like friends trying to convince you on Facebook of one candidate or the other. And um, what I will say, tell you is that by sitting on the sideline, you are not helping your own situation if you care about access in public lands like I really, you know, implore you all to take action, get involved in some way that you can, because it's, this is a real serious issue. Um, and if that is, you know, if public lands are something that, that's important to you, if, you know, coming out West once a year is important to you to go hunting or you live out West and you like, to, you like access and you sort of take it for granted, like most of us do that you have wide open spaces everywhere. Um, you know, it's not, it's not guaranteed it's going to be there forever. And if, if we don't do something about it and push back, it will not be there. And I, I don't mean to sound too alarmist, but that's just the facts. Huh. Um, so please get involved if you, if you aren't already in this conversation, because it's, it's an important one. What are those best ways to get involved, to take action and to not just be idle in this? Um, well, a few things, you know, I, Number one, join conservation groups that are fighting the cause on this. Um, so join those groups uh, if you can, right? Pay your membership dues. Uh, number two, um, write your congressman. Uh, they pay attention when you send them an email. And if you can get you know, a friend to send an email, they'll pay attention to both of you. Excuse me. So if you can, if you can write your congressman, your elected officials, that matters. Make a phone call. Um, you know, there are a handful of petitions floating around out there on, on public lands. You know, sign one of those petitions. Um, write a letter to the editor. Um, very simple, 200 words. Talk about why public lands matter to you. Um, so literally, you know, anything and everything is, is helpful and important. And if you still want to do more than that, um, email me, and I will be glad to, to help you, you know, do more if that's what you want to do. Yeah, I think a, a lot of us just need to uh, set our skepticism and our, you know, frankly, probably for a lot of us, myself included, bad <laughs> attitude aside. Like, because you hear about things of like, yeah, you know, freaking send an email. What is that going to do? But, you know, mm-hmm. on, on this issue as well as others, I mean, I, I have heard um, that, you know, especially in volume, that those things do matter. Um, and, you know, volume is created by individuals. So it's you and me all doing this. And that's what creates volume. volume. That's what creates momentum. That's what gets attention um, in the offices of um, the folks that matter, you know, those decision makers. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because they're um, complacency is the number one reason that we are, we are where we're at right now. Frankly, um, if you, I mean, it's, it's just frankly, um, I don't mean to, you know, it's, I think it's a little dangerous, frankly, for us all to be complacent on this issue. There are, you know, I, I hear from politicians, you know, about, you know, I ask them, you know, why did you vote a certain way? You know, they might consider hunters to be a part of their, you know, their quote unquote base, but they don't vote in the best interest of hunters. And when you ask them, why'd you do that? It's like, well, you know, I can do whatever I want. Like, what am I going to hear from like two hunters? Like, they're not organized enough to actually like, you know, inflict any pain upon me. And that's just the way politics works. And I know that's off putting to folks, but you know, there are times where it's really, you really got to step up. And this is one of those times. This is like, this is a fight of a generation. And, and if there's one time you pick to get involved in politics, I'd say in one issue, 
I'd say this is it <laughs> <laughs> um, because this is a real threat. And, you know, get on the other, the other way you can sort of stay in the know is, you know, there are groups, you know, in your state, if you live in a Western state, there are groups um, like here in Idaho, like Idaho Wildlife Federation has a great, um, my, my brother happens to run that organization, but there's a great, uh, you can get on their email list serve and they'll tell you what's going on at the legislature. And then when there's, you know, time to go testify, you can show up and testify, but every state has something, some group who, who is working on the issue locally, who can keep you up to speed and plug you in, um, when necessary or, or if you want to. Yeah. This is a maybe a loaded question um, and one that is obviously somewhat speculation at this point. But what what do you think, if anything, um, in terms of these issues and the election results, not just of obviously President Elect Trump, but you know the way that Congress is shaken out and things like that? I mean, does that do the results of the election change how you see this issue? Does it give you any more optimism? Any more? Um, concern anything like that or it's just kind of you know let's wait and see can we go to the next question mark <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry>. um <clears throat> I, I i don't want to um i don't want to make this a partisan issue um but i mean there's just I, I don't know how to sugarcoat it but yeah I, i'm i'm scared out of my mind right now frankly um because congress has the power to to, to pass laws that affect public lands and, you know, <laughs> um, the folks in, I will say the folks in the house of representatives who've been in charge over there have been introducing, not, not all of them, but there have been a, you know, a group of folks who have been introducing bills over there that have been passing the house, but not the Senate, um, for a while now that are very directly aimed at attacking public lands. And now we have, um, some of those folks that are now in control of the Senate. Um, and this is not a partisan issue. This is just facts, um, <clears throat> you know, and I'm, I, it has nothing to do with Trump. This is just Congress. <clears throat> Trump, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the president doesn't have the power to do anything on public lands. He can, you know, veto, veto legislation. But for the most part, Congress is where the action's at. And right now, you know, we'll see. I don't want to get out ahead of myself here, but, and I, I think that we have a, a road to hoe in front of us on on making sure, you know, just very at a very basic level that public lands just stay public. Um, and I I really wish I, this is not a partisan issue. It historically was not a partisan issue. Um, but there's just no denying the fact that I think the folks that are in charge right now have a, a you know, for the past like, you know, three years have been trying to pass a number of bills that uh, – would directly uh, undermine public lands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. Hmm. I mean, again, not to get partisan, I, I tend to be more um, like in many ways, states' rights, smaller government, if you will. But it's like you said earlier, a lot of the rhetoric, rhetoric around this issue and framing it as states' rights um, can be misleading um, because it's one of those issues where the states are essentially... Uh, not only ill-equipped, they don't have the funds, they don't have the capabilities to continue to manage public lands that the federal government does. You know, issues that yeah. I've <laughs> never considered, but that have brought up, been brought up in previous guests of things like, look at what the federal government spends uh, per year just on managing uh, federal lands from a fire perspective. And the numbers yeah. there are just astronomical, and there's no way that the states could take on that burden and continue to keep those lands public and manage them. They're going to essentially have to begin to sell off some of these lands because they essentially can't afford to manage them. They can't afford to hold them. So yeah, it you, gets you, you, it gets interesting. Yeah, you'd either have to you have to raise taxes astronomically, or you have to sell land. And uh, I can tell you which one's going to happen. Mm. <clears throat> We're not going to start raising taxes astronomically in Western states. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I hate the fact this issue has been, you know, divided around mostly. It's not true though in every state, but in some places it is a part of, become a partisan issue, but 
You know, it's, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, public lands are historically an incredibly bipartisan issue. Um, you know, no matter what, whether you're Democrat or Republican, um, if you value access, um, then, you know, this issue <clears throat> can be for you. Public lands can be an issue for you. And, you know, there are, I know lots of folks on both sides of the aisle who, who are strong, uh, supporters of public lands and conservation and the folks, you know, the folks I'll give them credit. The folks that want to privatize public lands, they have done their homework and their market research and they have, they realized that, you know, the way to make this whole issue work, the way to get what they want is to try and couch it in terms of states' rights and talk yeah. about small government and limited government. Mm-hmm. Very savvy way to message this. It is utter and complete. I'll, I'll, I won't use the word I want to use because I know you have kids listening. <laughs> nonsense. Um, it is total nonsense. Um, yeah. This has nothing to do with states' rights. This has nothing to do with limiting government. This is all about access and privatizing public lands, and it's that simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cool. Well, we appreciate the perspective for sure. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's going to be interesting, and um, yeah, we just all have to stay aware and stay involved. I know. Got me all worked up now, Mark. <laughs> Getting all restless. Yeah, I'm going to go like write some letters to the editor right now, I think. Uh, do it, man. <laughs> do it. <laughs> well, hopefully we get some listeners worked up if they're not already. Yeah, oh, man. yeah and I, I, I will happily, if somebody wants more information, and I, I sincerely mean this, I am happy to talk to anybody anytime about this. Call me, email me. I genuinely am happy to talk to people on an individual basis. Um, about this issue it is that important and i I don't usually (laughs) throw that invitation out there like that but this this really does matter to me so yeah if anybody out there wants to wants more you know don't hesitate to get in touch i'm happy to talk to you yeah and i'll take the heat for that one so we're not spreading your uh information across the internet but if you guys do want to get in contact with brad go ahead and email us uh at the podcast to podcast at com, and we can we can get you guys in touch for sure if you want to have those discussions um, Brad, a, a question that we love asking all of our guests, although oftentimes we forget to do it, but it's just always helpful, I think, to hear from, you know, both new and experienced hunters is what's something that you are continuing to learn or continuing to work on as a hunter? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, what I love about hunting is I feel, uh, I feel like I'm, it's, I've never, <laughs> I can never learn enough. Um, so for me, I think this year, um, two, well, there are two things that I feel like I, uh, I'm continuing to learn that the line between aggressiveness and patience is really gray sometimes for me. Um, you know, I would say my style of hunting is probably more on the, the run and gun aggressive side and it, it has worked fairly well for me. Um, but you know, it's also, you know, cost me some opportunities. And so, you know, that decision, I'm always like reevaluating that decision point on, should I just like sit back and be patient or should I like make a move and see if it works? And sometimes making a move, you know, split, split second decision, you make a move and, and you're in position and it works and it pays off. Other times you do it and you blow it and you're like, well, that was a dumb decision. So trying to like hone in and constantly, you know, learn from my mistakes and figure out, you know, when's the time to be aggressive and make a move and when's the time to just be patient and, and not, you know, blow it. Um, that's one thing I'm learning. The other one is just, um, I'm a, uh, sort of a stubborn person by nature. And I think one of the only, uh, values of being really stubborn is that it can sometimes help you, um, you know, kill animals when other people are tired or, um, you know, want to go home and, this year in particular, that's the reason I killed my bull with my, my bow is because, you know, it had been miserable conditions and literally everybody left the mountains <laughs> except for a few of us. And, uh, I had the whole place to myself and I was able to, was able to get a decent bull because I was just stubborn and persistent. And I, I remember that every time I get uncomfortable, I get miserable. I keep telling, I always have to tell myself that, you know, this is like the time when you need to like stick it out. Um, and don't, don't head out of the mountains just because you're, you're wet and cold. Yeah. Yeah. Good lessons. Great advice. Sure. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, uh, what's, what's some resources where should our listeners, um, 
follow you, you know, the Argali site for sure, but kind of give us that address as well as any place on social media or anything else that uh, <laughs> listeners can check out what you're up to, what your companies are up to and things like that. Okay. Uh, ArgaliOutdoors.com is our site. Um, and uh, my, uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Argali Official, or you can follow me as well at brad.a.brooks uh, on Instagram. Um, I think that's it. You can also sign up on our website for an uh, uh, email to serve, and I promise not to spam you with too many things, um, but occasionally I'll email you with whatever's going on in Argali. Uh, that's about it. Awesome. Well, yeah, listeners, go check out the site. As we talked about earlier, the films are there, those articles are there, the information on the backcountry meals we talked about, as well as other uh, good advice is all on that site, so go check it out. Brad, thanks so much for your time, man. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. That is a wrap on this episode. Thank you so much to Brad for joining us, and thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. As always, we would love to see the review on iTunes or contact us via email to podcast at exomountaingear.com with any questions, comments, or feedback that you might have.